Hello and welcome to another edition of Exclusive Interview coming to you live from the studios of 84 TV Radio Abuja, Nigeria. My name is Stanley Bentu. Today on the show, armed conflict, forced displacement, climate change, induced disasters and protracted crises have disrupted the education of over 75 million children and youths globally. And that number is growing in an unprecedented way with the spread of COVID-19. Education has been hit particularly hard by the COVID-19 pandemic with 1.3 billion learners out of school and 184 countrywide school closures impacting 87% of the world's total enrolled learners. Dropout rates across the globe are likely to rise as a result of this massive disruption of the education access. Now, while other critical needs such as health, water, sanitation are being responded to, education needs cannot be forgotten. And these have an equally detrimental impact if they're left unaddressed. The pylon effect of coronavirus is that during the global COVID-19 pandemic, interruptions to education can have long-term implications, especially for the most vulnerable. There is a risk of regression for students whose basic foundational learning was not strong enough to begin with. Let's have a look at this report. The COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria is part of the worldwide pandemic of coronavirus disease 2019 caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. The first confirmed case in Nigeria was announced on the 27th of February 2020 when an Italian citizen in Lagos tested positive for the virus. On the 9th of March 2020, a second case of the virus was reported in Iwekuru, Ogun State, a Nigerian citizen who had contact with the Italian citizen. Nigeria has since recorded over 16,000 infections with over 400 deaths. Responding to the crisis in March, President Mohamed Buhari announced a lockdown measure to curb the spread of the virus. State governors followed suit. These measures disrupted education at all levels, as learning institutions, including universities, were shut down for several months. The continued closure of schools has caused a major interruption in the students' learning process and assessments. As the lockdown orders are eased and the economy opens up, how prepared are Nigerian universities to tackle the challenge of learning in a corona-infected world. Today on the show, we speak with the Vice-Chancellor of the Federal University Gashua, Professor Andrew Haruna. He's an intellectual who achieved spectacular success from very humble beginnings, a graduate from the University of Maiduguri. He went on to bag a certificate in linguistics field methods at the Summer Institute of Linguistics, High Wycombe, England. This was followed by a master's degree and ultimately a PhD from the University of London. Professor Harna, who is fluent in English, German, Hausa and Gordon languages, shares this remarkable journey on exclusive interview. We're now joined by the Vice Chancellor of the Federal University Gashua. His name is Professor Andrew Haruna. Professor, welcome to Thank the program. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, um, not too long ago, our world were turned upside down by yeah. the coronavirus Indeed. pandemic. Yeah. So what would you say, what impact would you say COVID-19 has had on your institution and on education at large? Well, before making any remark or comment about my own institution, I think there is something that we need to, 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 to thank coronavirus for. One, coronavirus or COVID-19 has brought a radical change in our way of life in our way of thinking, in our business, and the topic we are discussing on education, which is very, very critical. Mm. Also, COVID-19 has brought us to understand how deficit the infrastructure facilities available our institutions for e-learning. This is something we need to know. Mm -hmm. uh, thirdly, it has also exposed the way the global setup is and it has prepared us for the future, something which we have not planned for, perhaps, in the third world countries. Uh, in the third world countries, particularly, many things have been lost and will be lost. Even in the so-called first uh, world countries, a lot of things also have changed radically. So I have to put this in course before I move to any remark on my own uh, institution. Mm. Um, COVID-19 
has brought a radical change, like I said. It has brought us to understand the currency for the future in education globally now is e-learning. Without this um, uh, pandemic, perhaps it could have been very slow, but now it has pushed us in a very high speed to acknowledge and to also actually prepare more, much faster than before. Mm. So speaking of e-learning, because yeah. the government had to shut down yeah. for a while and people couldn't go to school for a very long period of time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not really certain. Are you, are you back in session? Is you in well, not yet, session? not yet, not yet. Not yet. But you're preparing for. We are preparing so for. In that interim period, mm -hmm. uh, what were some of the steps that that you took to make sure that learning didn't stop? Well, uh, in some other institutions, honestly speaking, if I have to be honest, it's almost total uh, shutdown because of some infrastructural deficit. But in some institutions, you know, institutions in Nigeria are of a different generation, uh, particularly our universities. They are the first generation universities. They are the second generation universities, which came in the 70s. And then the third generation universities, which my own university is one of them. Now we are just picking up. And uh, a lot of uh, money has been pumped into these universities by government to bring us to the international standard. Now we are just in the process of actually maturing when they stepped in. So in an institution like mine, I can tell you that there are a lot of challenges in terms of first, infrastructure. Mm. Secondly, uh, even the, the, you know, to, to, to change the working habit of lecturers and students to, to catch up with the current trend of events uh, are some of the challenges. Next, you see, we come from the northeastern part of the country where insurgency has actually devastated the region. Because we are from Yobe State, which is uh, in the northeast. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the states. One, one of the states. Much much indeed, the indeed, indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. So you find internet connectivity, electricity supply, and uh, generally uh, uh, this kind of services uh, are still coming up. They have not been well established, even though in the past it was so. Mm. But so the insurgency... How did you cope? Well, w there are three sources of uh, electricity, if I might say. One, light that comes from electricity from the national grid, uh, there is a, which is from Power Holding Company of Nigeria. Then we have solar to back up. Then we also have our generators which although running them are very expensive in a small institution like mine, we just have about under 5,000 students, where this, uh, what you charge uh, from students is not enough to, 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 do any, to provide all the services you need to give them. So th this is how we are trying to cope, and we're doing well. Mm. One of the things I read is uh, COVID-19, and interestingly enough, you mentioned that, mm. that we should be thankful yeah. for the problems that this has thrown up and also how we can tackle it. Yeah. And one of the things I read is that the COVID-19 crisis has thrown up inequalities. Yeah. So you, you have students and pupils in lower in the lower education cadre mm -hmm. who have access mm -hmm. maybe to more internet mm -hmm. and are able to get into mm -hmm. online education, mm -hmm. uh, having it better than those in other areas where the, the internet supply is a little bit problematic. Mm -hmm. Have you experienced such inequalities? And, and if you have, um, what are some of the innovative approaches that sh that you have uh, carried on to tackle these? Well, this I can only give you a post idea of what we are thinking t uh, of doing. Mm. Since uh, we just finished our first semester when everything uh, passed on us and mm. the institution was shut down. So we were not prepared for a full-blown e-learning before COVID-19. Like I told you, we are just a young institution and we are trying to grow and government is really pumping a lot of money in these institutions to pick up. Now that it has happened, and we are just midway, uh, all what I can tell you is I can foresee some of the challenges which we have to cope with when the institution is open. Mm. One, like I told you, the insurgency which we have uh, experienced, but the military are doing quite well. In my own institution, we have never shut down the school for a single day because of an attack because the host community is supportive, particularly the AMIA 
and we have the president of the Senate from that community, and they have been doing so well in terms of giving us all the necessary support and protection, and the military have done so well. But what I can see is that uh, the background of the students is so diverse, coming from a rural and agrarian society. Uh, there are students who have come from all over the country because I have encouraged students from all parts of the country being a federal institution. The beauty is to encourage interaction so that we can see the Nigerian state in action in one small space. Now, these students have different backgrounds. Some students have parents who can afford computers. Some have come from cities where the computers, internet services are not new. Now, in some of the rural areas, particularly in the northeast region, many students were encountering computer for the first time. For the very first time. And because of this, it's okay. a big challenge. Mm -hmm. So this kind of background, diverse background of students, of those who come from the city and those who come from rural areas, plus indigent students who, as a result of the insurgency, has actually affected the livelihood of the parents or the livelihood of the students themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that point, Professor. I'll let mm. you speak a little bit more on that. Mm. We'll take a break. And when we come back, while well, schools are about to reopen, the federal government has given the green light for that to happen somewhere down the line. So mm. what steps have been taken by the Federal University of Gashua to keep students healthy and safe? Don't go away. We'll be right back. Universities are not ready to tackle the challenge of learning in a corona infected way. For them to be fully prepared, certain measures have to be put in place like provision of hand washing facilities and sanitizers at every entrance, be it the classrooms, the offices, labs, etc. Also, provision of thermometric devices to the security personnel, compulsory face masks, and I also think sporting activities should be suspended or at least minimized to prevent contacts. As the world faces the challenge of the coronavirus pandemic and governments around the world are racing against time, AD4 TV Radio thanks you all for doing your part to stop the spread of the disease. Be safe at home and practice hygiene. Protect yourself and others. Do not panic. Do not self-medicate. Listen to all preventive advice and stay at home as well as maintain social distancing. Say no to fake news. Get authentic updates from the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, the Federal Ministry of Health, the NCDC, and of course, 84 TV Radio, your reliable and credible channel. Please stay safe to save others. I would expect the school to abide by the rules, the normal sanitizers, face masks, and also I would expect them to consider students because some of us were about to start exams before the whole thing started. So they should at least give us little time before we start the exams. I'm expecting the school to fumigate the environment, like make everywhere safe for students, then provide water and soap for students to wash their hands before going into campus like before entering the school then in front of their um, classes hostels whatever then they should provide hand sanitizers and face masks too welcome back to exclusive interview we've been uh, having a chat with the vice chancellor of the federal university gashua professor andrew haruna and we're talking about how to keep students safe in the post covid 19 era uh, professor before we went to the break you were uh, you know spelling out to us some of the arrangements that you have made oh. but what, what changes have been made in in the school in the university as students prepare to return to school sometime in the future? Well, I would rather frame your question. What changes are we planning to, to make? Mm. You know, when, when, when the COVID-19 hit us so hard, you remember there was a total shutdown, not only of institutions, business, and even the states. Interstate travels were shut down. And I think it has not yet been lifted. But in t within the states, some governments or state governors have already opened up. But between state and state, not many states have opened that. And I don't think if there is any that has actually declared this. So what I'm saying that, you see, we have not yet come back or we have not yet returned to school. Mm. Nonetheless, skeletal services, which are essential, are there. The security and uh, protecting some of the equipments we have, like our computers, 
to keep the dust off, but very, very skeletal because we must respect the laws of the Federation and also obey health instructions. Mm -hmm. Now, what some of the things we are planning through Zoom interaction with some of the principal officers and when we meet, one, we are looking at how do we address this diverse background of our students. Secondly, how do we manage power supply? Even though I mentioned three sources, one, the national grid, solar, and then our generators. But then you see we have very, very little income in terms of uh, our idea. So thirdly, we are looking at how do we move our lecturers from the tra traditional way of teaching to the current currency, which is e-learning. You know, many are used to the old way of doing things face to face. So you need to provide them with both technical training, not only technical, you also have to provide them with how to prepare modules, how to prepare their lectures, and how to even have this kind of interaction. You know, it's like being in the studio. If someone is not in the studio severally, you'll find it very difficult to face the cameras and then handle equipment when other people are looking at him or her. We are looking at that. We are also looking at the student side. How do we give them the orientation to be able to cope with this? There's another big challenge. Most of the infrastructure, like I mentioned, not only equipment or technical, we also have challenges with classroom space. Now, if you have a large class, which you are managing before through the face-to-face -face interaction, now we have to obey the social distance. Mm -hmm. We have to obey uh, the rules provided by the health authorities. How do we cope with a large number of students when we don't already have enough space for them? So we have to think of how do we split classes to be able to cope. If you do that successfully, what of the lecturers? Do you have enough lecturers to cope with this? So these are some of the issues we are brainstorming with the management, with deans and the heads of department. And we are working out all these things. By the time we get back to school, we make sure that at least we are ready for this kind of uh, services. Mm -hmm. Next, we are looking at even if we provide uh, technical services, what of the reliability? of this. These are areas we all look at it. Secondly, we also look at uh, is it e-learning as a result of COVID-19 that we are prepared for? What of if another pandemic comes after? That's right. What, what, what do we do? What, what, what would you do? So you see, these are all postulations. And what do you think the role of, of the university should what, be? What, these are postulations which as academics we are trained to think for the future. We don't praise ourselves for the things that have passed, but we are always looking at what is the university of the future going to be like. And so for the past few months or weeks, NUC, Ministry of Education, Committee of Vice Chancellors, they have been discussing and bringing ways, you know, through s seminars as a result, you know, using Zoom and getting all the stakeholders engaged. So the NUC, which is National Universities Commission, the Minister of Education, thank God we have a Minister of Education who is very keen, and as a matter of fact, you can say he has read the riot act that we must move into this modern way of doing things. So there's a lot of awareness. Mm. These this three stakeholders, Minister of Education, NUC, uh, Committee of Vice Chancellors, mobilizing and reorienting lecturers, giving them the task to prepare for the opening of schools when the time comes. Mm, very interesting. And uh, yes. it would be quite critical to mm. see how the university is going to approach in this uh, new world that we're moving into. But I want to hear uh, mm. a little bit more about yourself. Very interesting story mm -hmm. I, I got. You come mm. from very humble beginnings, and I'm, I'm awed by you know what you've accomplished becoming a vice chancellor of uh, mm -hmm. a third generation university mm -hmm. but what was your journey because um you you started life very humbly mm -hmm. shining shoes yeah indeed well if there is any story i am proud of which i always like to share with anybody is that i was once a shoe shiner mm. okay and i clean shoes so i might even say covid 19 has not become a threat to me 
because I could have died with the dirt of cleaning shoes long time ago than now. Now COVID-19 has come, and if I look at what, had, what I had passed through in the past, every day I look at my life, I say, well, I thank God. It's a life of just appreciating God. Now, well, yes, you ask rightly, as a shoe shiner, I know my father doesn't have money, neither my mother, because they have not been to school, and I was sent to school by Providence, and uh, I managed to, to, to pass my WAEC, but unfortunately, I didn't have much money, or I didn't have money to move on. So the only option is for me to go and earn a living, but I, have, I was taught not just to be lazy or to beg. I was taught hard work, honesty, integrity. And my mother used to say, then to steal, you better go and beg so that you could be given something to eat. So to be a shoe shiner was never a, a disgraceful thing because I value whatever I do and I respect it if it will give me my dignity. And that's how I started. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, after the shoe, well, I, as I was cleaning the shoes, a lady by name Hajia Hawa Abdullahi, she comes from Gaza, I fixed her shoes one day, and she found that, oh, I did so well because I returned her change to her. Then she asked me, have you been to school? I said, yes, I, I had been. Why are you cleaning shoes? I said, I had nobody to help me. She said, oh, do you want to work in the post office? I said, yes. So from the cleaning shoes, I was upgraded to selling stamps in the post office. But then you see, you, you sell stamps in the post office where you, before you are outside the post office cleaning shoes, hardly would you make any sales. So I was not even making sales after my training. So I had to ask the postmaster to please transfer me from my degree to another station where nobody knew my background as a shoe shiner. I hope you understand. You, I cleaned your shoes yesterday, and today you see me across the counter <laughs> collecting your money. You know, it's funny. So I was sent to Gongola State then, which is uh, Yola. But even there, I said I wanted to save some money and go back to school. So from there, I was sent to Newman, where I worked for one year. After one year, I saved enough money, then I resigned. I went back to remedial studies to go and start my, to continue my education. I had to do arts courses because my father had wanted me to become a medical doctor. But I don't want to be a medical doctor at all. I love cultures. No, I, uh, yes, <laughs> I, I don't want to be a medical doctor. I was passing all my science courses in secondary school. I could pass the exams, but I knew within myself I would not be a good doctor in the hospital. But I love arts and culture. So I switched to study languages. And with languages, I studied linguistics and house language and most of the languages of the lecture basin. And uh, well, from my first degree, university of my degree, by the grace of God, I did well. So we had a wonderful vice chancellor, Professor Jibril Aminu, who really wanted to see a first class university. So he developed the infrastructure of the university and also developed the manpower. And that legacy was what I had also carried along. Jibril Aminu is a refined man who has actually put so much in us. And he taught us to respect every Nigerian who was teaching in the university and to do the right thing. He sent us abroad for studies. I studied at the University of London for both my master's and PhD. And I taught also at the university. Mm -hmm. But I res after some time, I came back. Then there was a long as a strike like it, <laughs> it is now, <laughs> uh, between <laughs> 93 to 4. That's right. So uh, I felt then also staying idle, I went back to my local government with my PhD and requested that if I could be offered a job to teach in the primary school. Because after leaving England to come back to Nigeria, long school closure, no job, and since I had had the time like a shoe shiner, so to teach in second primary school was never a problem. Mm. But thank God, as I was about to start teaching, the crisis was resolved. And your career took so my there, career took there. You've come this far. I come uh, this quick far. question I would like to ask you, what, what is it about your experience then as a shoe shiner that, that shaped you now that you are an administrator? Well, um, there's nothing difficult in my life today which I have not experienced in the past such that I will be complaining. So even as I was sent to Gashua, 
many people will say, oh, how would you go to such a distant place? After I have been teaching in Germany for many, many years. And it was from Germany, I returned to Nigeria, and by the grace of God, I was appointed a vice chancellor, then to Geshua, from temperature below zero to 45 degrees. Mm. But the life, the mosquitoes, the heat, the sun, the dust, were things I experienced when I, was, when I was growing. Okay. So I just see it as an opportunity mm. to make sure that these young kids, who perhaps may not have been educated, now they have a shoe shiner, somebody who experienced their own life. I, I found it just as a normal thing. And what I can do is just to serve Nigeria, not to ask Nigeria to do anything to me again. Remember, from a shoe shiner, got scholarship to study in the UK, up to PhD, came back to Nigeria, got a job in the university, employed in, in Europe. I taught in more than seven universities in Germany. Mm -hmm and uh, in Switzerland and Austria and Italy. I taught in all these places. And on my return, I returned on my own so that I could serve my country. Mm. So uh, just as a way of rounding up, Professor, I would like to ask you, what would you say to a lot of young Nigerians out there who are going through a lot, uh -huh. and some of them are feeling nothing is going to happen to them. They're, they're not going to have this dream as, as you have. What would you say to them? Well, uh, what I can say first and foremost is hard work. If you want to become somebody or some, you want to occupy an office, don't look at the office. Ask yourself, what are the requirements for that office? And how do I get to that office? Avoid any shortcuts. You may have the qualification, but you also need the experience. Because this is very, very important, or else you crash. Secondly, be honest, be hardworking, and be somebody of integrity. Let your worth be judged by your character, not from the amount of money in your pocket or what you own as a way of property. Mm. You've, you've also had a career in broadcasting. Yes. I understand. What would you say to young broadcasters? Well, um, don't turn it into a show business be, be, because we judge you from outside. Now, if you speak, I'm a linguist. Now, if I have three Nigerians, say one from the east, one from the west, one from the north, and they're in an interview like we are having, and give me an example, as a teacher, somebody from the north, if he wants to say one, two, three, four, five, six, or 55, or 54, the likelihood is you'll hear 54, 55, 56. Right. Now, my children or the students in kindergarten will copy this habit. Now, if you are a broadcaster and you are saying the president of Nigeria, then out there you are hitting us with some negative attitude, whereas you are addressed so gorgeously, but what comes out of your mouth is terrible in terms of uh, pronunciation of the phonetics of the words you pronounce. If you are from Benway, perhaps you will say, I'm not criticizing people, but this is the reality when people speak, and you have to tell them this is the way you go about it. You say, Lady of Benway, or Lega Lega Music. Or if you are from the West, <laughs> you, you can be a professor. But if you don't pronounce the words well, people may read you also negatively from your pronunciation. I have been to the shosh instead of church. Mm. Okay? Uh, or I, I, I eat my head, which means I hit my head. So th this kind of pronunciation habit for a broadcaster Speaking to the whole nation is something that you journalists also have to be sensitive to and, and be prepared for. So, so don't your, pay much attention to your clothing. How did your involvement in broadcasting come about? No, it's just a, as a hobby and also as a teacher. As a teacher, I am always sensitive to what do the broadcaster say is over the television. Mm. So okay. And I always remind them, don't pay much attention to how you dress. Pay attention to how you speak. Because you are communicating something and you cannot reverse it. Mm. If you say a word which I cannot understand, the whole thing is defeated. You know, by just missing a word, it can be a big disaster. Imagine somebody from the western part of the country is in the control tower of the aer uh, at the airport. And someone from the northern part of the country is the pilot. And the control tower is saying, go higher, higher, because there is a high hill to be hit, maybe the aeroplane is having some problem. Right. He would say, aya, aya, aya. 
whereas the pilot who comes from the northern part of the country may not quite follow. He'll be saying, pardon, pardon, and 30 seconds the plane could crash. Could be the difference between life and death. Good. So, you see, so this is a danger. your experience in, in broadcasting, uh, where, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I'm not a professional broadcaster. Mm. You see, I was just doing it for, hobby, uh, for, for hobby. As a hobby. As a hobby, when I'm invited to speak, or when I'm invited to teach phonetics, or how to pronounce certain words by, you know, uh, journalists. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. It's been such a pleasure having mm. you here. Mm -hmm. uh, we wish you the best of luck in your endeavors. It's a tough challenge that you have in this era of uh, COVID-19, uh, having to deal with all of the returning students. And uh, so we wish you the best. It's a pleasure to have had you. Thank you very much. But to correct one impression, it's not a tough. Professors are meant to, to, to address tough issues and to bring solutions to them. So this is interesting. So this is, <laughs> it's <laughs> what you do. Thank you very much, <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you. <laughs> All right, we will be right back. Mm. Now that was a very interesting conversation with the Vice Chancellor of the Federal University, Gashua, Professor Haruna. We talked about several things. And as we were speaking, several things came to my mind. If schools are closed due to a public health emergency, administrators should realize that teaching and learning do not need to grind to a halt. They can continue through programs using innovative approaches. There are many examples of radio, television, cell phone, and internet-based learning options that can be deployed. UNESCO recently published a list of platforms and programs for online learning that may be useful to schools. If distance learning is long-term, careful attention should be placed on language of instruction and content progression and uh, relevance for the students. Continuing to pay teachers and staff during school closures are very important. This not only allows for economic stability during the crisis, but it also avoids having them seek other employment and leaving the profession. Reopening schools safely is critical. School systems should put in place a transparent plan for reopening schools quickly and responsibly, at least as responsibly as possible. Now, this will include preparing physical schools for reopening, providing teachers with accurate information, and training for the public health crisis. Using schools as an opportunity to quickly monitor and trace reemergence and also uh, providing any additional physical or mental support that students may need, especially in high, high incident areas. Well, that's it for exclusive interview today. Join us again for the next episode. Until then, thank you for stopping by.